On today's episode, a future space station explodes, SpaceX is up to something in Australia, Falcon 9 returns to flight, and NASA finds life on Mars? This is the latest prototype from Sierra Space of their inflatable life habitat module, and as you can see, it just exploded. Again. This is the second full-scale ultimate burst pressure test that Sierra has performed with the LIFE 285 design. What makes this different from the initial burst test conducted last December is the addition of a large metal blanking plate to the inflatable pressure shell. The idea is that this plate will simulate a window, or any other kind of rigid point that Sierra might want to use for mounting something like a robotic arm, an antenna, or other equipment. What they're testing is the strength of the interface between the soft goods shell of the module and the metal blanking plate. Windows are great to have, but they also create a potential failure point, so this is where the company is directing a lot of their high-speed cameras and sensors. The result that Sierra is looking for would be something similar to their 2023 test, which reached 77 psi of internal pressure before exploding. That's well above NASA's maximum safety requirement of 60 psi, which is significantly higher still than the module's standard operating pressure, which will be an Earth-like 14 psi. The result of this recent test came in at 74 psi of ultimate burst pressure, which is exactly what Sierra was hoping for. It shows that the integration of the blanking plate did not weaken the structure, while the company can demonstrate repeatability and consistency across their prototype builds. What we're seeing on the exterior of this test module is the woven Vectran material that Sierra calls their restraint layer. Vectran is similar to Kevlar but is designed for use in outer space. There's Vectran in NASA's EVA suit, and the landing airbags on the old Mars rovers were also made of Vectran. It's incredibly strong stuff. And if you look at Sierra's cross-section of a life shell, this is just layer number 8. There are 4 layers of MMOD protection that go on top. That stands for micrometeoroid and orbital debris. Then on top of that is a thermal blanket, and on top of that is a barrier to protect against atomic oxygen. Sierra says in their latest video that their MMOD layers are currently at NASA's White Sands testing facility, undergoing high-speed projectile testing. Basically, they're shooting at them with a 50 caliber rifle and seeing what happens. So at some point in the future, we'll see the pressure shell and the MMOD come together for final burst testing. And that should provide the answer for anyone wondering how resilient this inflatable module actually is. Until then, Sierra is still planning to deploy and test their Life 285 in orbit within the next few years. That's the size that we're looking at right now. It's 9 meters in diameter and provides one-third the internal volume of the ISS. The company's goal for the end of this decade would be Life 500, which would still fit inside any conventional rocket fairing, then inflate to 9 meters in diameter and 10 meters in length with an internal volume of 500 cubic meters, more than half the pressurized volume of the ISS. SpaceX is up to something in Australia. According to a new update from Reuters, SpaceX is in talks with US and Australian officials to land and recover a future Starship upper stage off of Australia's coast. Now, Reuters does publish a lot of stories about Elon Musk companies that cite unnamed sources, most of which Elon claims to be fake news, many of which still turn out to be true, so this is just something to consider. Anyway, there are two big payoffs involved with a deal like this. For one, SpaceX gains a practical landing site for these slightly less than orbital test flights they've been doing. The last Starship made a controlled touchdown somewhere in the Indian Ocean. As far as we know, that ship was not recovered. The new plan would be to launch Starship from Starbase, Texas, and then land it in the sea off of Australia's coast, then recover it onto Australian territory. This would be a huge step forward for a fully reusable Starship upper stage. The plan would be to recover the Starship after landing either in the ocean or on a floating barge, then tow it to a nearby port on the western or northern coast of Australia. But there are political complications that have to be dealt with first. Technically, this operation would be considered exporting sophisticated space technologies from the US to Australia, which is not permitted by current US export controls. But when it comes to Australia, we've already seen indications that restrictions can be eased in the interest of global security. 
Without getting too deep into the weeds here, the US wants to strengthen the capability of Australia to counter the Chinese in the South Pacific. China is aggressively expanding their military presence and the Americans need as many strong allies in the region as they can get to push back. In return, Australia would get more American-made resources to help pursue their own space program and launch industry. Given their proximity to the equator and access to open ocean on the eastern coast, Australia is kind of an ideal location for launching to orbit. Sources from the Reuters report claim that water landings off the Australian coast would be the first step in a larger Australian presence for SpaceX. This could expand into ground landings of the Starship upper stage on the Australian continent, and potentially even a future SpaceX launch facility. We know that the US Air Force is highly interested in Starship for their rocket cargo program which would involve point-to-point -point delivery of military equipment around the world. And SpaceX has already received over $100 million in military funding to pursue this concept. A demonstration flight launching from Texas and landing in Australia would be the exact kind of thing that the military is looking to see. The SpaceX Falcon 9 has returned to the skies in full force, with three Starlink missions launching in two days on July 27th and 28th, both from Cape Canaveral and Vandenberg Space Force Base. Falcon 9 was grounded on July 11th after a failure in the upper stage Merlin vacuum engine prevented the Starlink payload from reaching its desired orbit. This resulted in the loss of the satellites. SpaceX was able to quickly deduce that the failure resulted from a leak in the liquid oxygen system. An anomaly investigation that followed was able to narrow this down to a crack in a line that fed into a pressure sensor. SpaceX says the line cracked due to fatigue caused by high loading from engine vibration and looseness in a clamp that normally constrains the line. The company's near-term fix for this issue has been to follow an old Elon Musk philosophy. The best part is no part. They simply removed the line and the sensor in question from subsequent Merlin vacuum engines. In an update published on July 25th, SpaceX writes, The sensor is not used by the flight safety system and can be covered by alternative sensors already present on the engine. SpaceX said it has filed a mishap report to the FAA, which oversees such investigations. Although this particular investigation apparently remains open, the FAA gave a green light for Saturday's launch nonetheless. In their own statement, the Federal Administration writes, After a comprehensive review, the FAA determined no public safety issues were involved in the anomaly that occurred during the SpaceX Starlink Group 93 launch on July 11th. All three Falcon 9 launches over the weekend were successful, deploying over 60 Starlink satellites, many of which come with the updated capability of direct-to-cell phone communication. Depending on where you get your news, you may have heard recently that NASA just discovered life on Mars. They didn't, but they did find a very interesting rock that could contain the first hint of ancient microbes on the Red Planet. This discovery was made by the Perseverance rover on July 21st in a location known as the Jezero Crater, the dried up floor of an ancient Martian lake. And this sample of red rock is now the first Perseverance has examined that shows organic molecules, which is not life, but it is the building blocks of life. This isn't the first organic material collected on Mars either. Curiosity found something similar in 2014 in the Gale Crater. What makes this new sample unique is a speckled pattern of white spots with black rims, looking kind of like leopard spots. Perseverance examined the spots with instruments that can identify their chemical contents and found that the rims contain iron phosphate molecules. On Earth, rings with a similar texture and chemistry are associated with ancient microbial life. The chemical reactions that create these rings can be an energy source for microbes. Perseverance Deputy Project Scientist Katie Stack Morgan said, Based on our experience with similar things on Earth, there is a possibility that life could have been involved, and these could have a biological origin. This particular rock has even more unusual features that have scientists confused and intrigued. It's shot through with white veins of calcium sulfate, and these veins are filled with millimeter-sized crystals of olivine, a mineral that forms from magma. The inclusion of both the spots and these volcanic features in the same rock is a little bit mysterious, as they point to different origins. So figuring out how this rock formed could tell us how likely it is to have had the right conditions and temperatures to host biological life. 
Unfortunately, the only way to know for sure is to bring the rock to Earth for future study, which is a primary mission objective for Perseverance, although the infrastructure to support a sample return mission is currently on hold as NASA tries to figure out how they are going to pull off such a complicated mission architecture without the funding that they require. The current hope is that a private sector company will be able to provide the solution. Finding samples as intriguing as this can only help that case. It's easier to justify the cost of a Mars sample return if we are sitting on definitive proof that there is life beyond the Earth. Stay tuned.